March 25th, 2020. Um, this is the second virus video. Um, we're working on our virus introduction PowerPoint part one. The first video was a short little history of the discovery of viruses. And um, this second one, folks, I'm changing the title. We're going to call this the general characteristics of viruses. Okay. And we just want to start with this great um, quote from one of the famous early virologists, Max Delbruck, when he was asked what it was like to study bacterial viruses or bacteriophages. And I love his quote. He says, it's a fine playground for serious children to ask ambitious questions. Um, and that just strikes me, you guys, that so much of our natural curiosity we have about the world when we're kids, somehow I think that we, I'm not sure how or why, but through our educational system, somehow we destroy that, that, uh, that incredible curiosity that our kids have. So hopefully we can keep that curiosity alive in our kids as they grow up. Okay, back to viruses. All right, so... Um, let's see here. So, um, terminology folks, um, you'll see two words used to refer to what I call viruses. So, um, a virus and a virion. So I'll take the virion first. So a virus that's outside of its host cell, a virus outside of its host cell is officially called a virion. I never use the term virion. I always just use virus, right? Um, but if I was being more precise, if I was talking about a virus inside the host cell, that would be the correct time for me to call it a virus. And we can think of, you know, the true virus is when it's in, in the, um, when it's in the process of replicating itself inside of a host cell, that's what some folks would call the virus. And then when it escapes from the host cell, when it's just, it's really not able to do much, it has to wait to attach to and infect another cell, then some folks would call that the virion. But again, folks, I almost always just use the term virus. So here are some, but not all, of the general characteristics of viruses. So a lot of this you guys already know. So first of all, you want to remember viruses are acellular. They're not made of cells. And um, a really important question you might recall that we ask is when we're trying to classify a microbe is we ask the question, can the microbe synthesize a cell membrane? And if the answer is no, it can't synthesize a cell membrane, right off the bat we know it's acellular. So viruses can't synthesize cell membranes. Viruses lack ribosomes, so they can't make their own proteins. Viruses do not carry out metabolism, so they can't make their own ATP. And it's, um, it's a function of lacking ribosomes and not carrying out metabolism. Um, it's, a, it's, it's because of these limitations that viruses have to invade a host cell to replicate themselves because they're going to have to use the host cell ribosomes to make the viral proteins. They'll have to use the host cell building blocks and energy sources um, to, to replicate themselves. Um, you might recall we said that viruses have either DNA or RNA. If they have DNA, they're called DNA viruses. If they have RNA, they're called RNA viruses. Um, but we want to remember that unlike cells, viruses don't have both DNA and RNA. Now, always in Nature Guide, there's some goofy exceptions, but for us, in this introduction to virology, we'll say either a virus is a DNA virus or an RNA virus. Unfortunately, the novel coronavirus that's causing so much havoc is an RNA virus. And we know that's unfortunate because we know the enzymes that make RNA, the RNA polymerases, they don't proofread. So RNA viruses have the potential for really high mutation rates, and it might be this might be one reason why the coronaviruses always seem to be jumping from animal uh, um, reservoirs into humans. So um, there was SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, um, a coronavirus that they think jumped from bats to civet cats to humans, and then there's MERS, the Middle Eastern, um, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus that they think jumped from bats to camels to humans with really high mortality rates. And now with the novel coronavirus causing the present pandemic, one hypothesis is that it jumped from bats into these cool, cool animals called pangolins. I'd never seen them before. And then from the pangolins into humans. Or it might be that this new novel coronavirus jumped right from bats into humans. Okay, But again, folks, um, because the coronaviruses are RNA viruses, high mutation rates, that would increase the risk that they can jump from one host to another from, say, like a bat to a human. In contrast, the DNA viruses usually have lower mutation rates because we know that um, 
DNA polymerase that makes DNA, it can proofread, it can edit. So the DNA viruses have lower mutation rates than the RNA viruses. Viruses don't grow and divide um, like cells do, but rather they're assembled from parts. It's like, it's like putting together a car or a bicycle from parts, right? Um, with cells, cells grow bigger and then they divide, right? So the viruses are really different in, in that they are assembled from parts. And then, folks, this characteristic, all viruses have to replicate, make copies of themselves, um, make copies of themselves inside a host cell. So they're called obligate intracellular parasites. So, folks, um, two exam questions that sometimes confuse folks. If I go true or false, um, all viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. Is that true or false? That's true. But what confuses um, folks is what if I gave you a different true-false question? What if I asked you, um, or uh, what if I said only viruses are obligate intracellular parasites? And that's false because we know there's other microbes that are not viruses that are also obligate intracellular parasites. Um, so some, some bacteria are obligate intracellular parasites. Okay. And I think, okay, oh, good, you guys, here we go. So here's our to tobacco mosaic virus infecting plants. Here's our bacteriophage infecting a bacterium. Here's an influenza virus infecting or escaping from a human cell. And here, this was the uh, caption, you guys, I couldn't remember. This is HIV invading human cells. I thought it was a mucous membrane, but this must be like a, either it could be a monocyte or dendritic cell or a T helper lymphocyte. So if you are cellular, there's gonna be at least one virus that can infect you and replicate inside you and cause harm. These are just um, a possible um, study aid for lecture exam three, right? So comparing properties of viruses to cells. Um, again, just talking about general characteristics of viruses. Remember, they're really small. They're much, much smaller than um, our, our smallest cells. So, and again, folks, it depends on the book you read, um, the size range maybe 20, 30, 40 nanometers, all the way up to maybe 400 nanometers, we could probably just barely see a virus um, that has a diameter of 400 nanometers. Um, these would be some of the big pox um, virus members, like the smallpox virus. But again, folks, for our lecture exam, we're going to say you have to have a more powerful electron microscope to visualize most viruses. Usually you can't see viruses with your light microscope unless they're really big. So just, this, this is just kind of for fun, you guys. So um, when we um, express the diameter of viruses, we use nanometers, okay? And a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, 10 to the negative ninth meter. Um, and I love these little comparisons, you guys. So a nanometer is to a meter is three seconds are to a century, just to kind of get that size comparison. And for me, folks, this has always helped. I, I memorized the cell, uh, excuse me, the diameter of a mature um, um, human erythrocyte, red blood cell is around 7.5 to 8 micrometers. I kind of use that as my internal ruler if I'm looking at smears that have red blood cells in them. So if this is about, say, 8 micrometers across and I have a smaller cell like this E. coli here, it kind of gives me an idea about the size of the E. coli. So generically, size range for bacteria, and we usually use E. coli, maybe about 1 micrometer in um, width or in diameter, maybe two to three micro, micrometers um, in length, right? And then down here, all these little dot, dot, dots, you guys. Where there is my little pointer right here? Here we're looking at the size of viruses. So the smallest viruses, like our polio viruses, they're a hundred times smaller than a bacterium, and a thousand times smaller than a red blood cell. So they're just so little. And again, that was why we had to. We had to wait for the invention of electron microscopes before we could visualize them. Now we're going to zoom in. So again, folks, this is this is another size I kind of use as a is a uh, to give me perspective. So bacterial bacterial ribosomes are around 25 to 30 nanometers, and if we look here at a polio virus, the polio virus is about the same size as a ribosome, right? So it helps us to understand why the polio virus has to get inside a human cell and use all the human cell um, biosynthetic machinery to make copies of itself. There just doesn't have enough capacity inside. Here is our cool um, T4 bacteriophage that we introduced earlier, and we'll come back and talk about how it replicates itself in bacteria. It's really cool. This is just giving an example, folks, of the variety of um, viruses. So here's another um, 
bacterial virus, bacteriophage MS2, and it's almost looking like that polio virus there, but again, it's going to infect bacteria. Polio virus infects humans. And then, folks, over here is our tobacco mosaic virus. Um, so it has what's called a helical capsid, right? So even though it's very, very long, like 300 nanometers long, it's very, very thin. So again, we would have to have an electron microscope to be able to visualize it. And here, folks, this is um, um, an example of the pox virus family, some of the biggest viruses around. This is a smallpox or variola virus, um, the first infectious disease that's been eliminated from the wild, from nature, using um, quarantine and vaccination. And so you guys, with um, smallpox and the other pox um, family, members, we might just barely be able to visualize them in a light microscope. Okay. And so folks, now what we're going to do is look at um, the structure of viruses. So um, normally we'd be drawing on the whiteboard, but I think I think these cartoons will do it for us, you guys. So if we look at the simplest virus there is, okay, the simplest virus has to have some kind of genetic information. And remember, it's going to be DNA or RNA. And the DNA and RNA has to be covered by a protective coat, a protein coat called a capsid. So you guys, if that little pink squiggle there represents the nucleic acid of the virus, then this blue polygon represents the protein coat called the capsid. Right? Capsids are made of protein subunits called capsomeres. And depending on how the caps capsomeres are arranged, the capsids can have different shapes. And virologists will use the shape of a capsid to help them identify unknown um, unknown uh, viruses. So folks, here are um, three basic categories of shapes. Don't worry about these too much, but there's helical, where the capsomeres form a spiral tube around the nucleic acid. So remember, our tobacco mosaic virus was a helical, a helical virus. And then this is a real common shape called polyhedral, where the capsomeres, they form like a geodesic dome around the nucleic acid. So here's some cool polyhedral rhinoviruses. Rhinoviruses can cause relatively mild upper respiratory tract infections like colds. And the most common um, icosahedral, excuse me, the most common polyhedral arrangement is called an icosahedral capsid with 20 triangular faces. That's really cool. Um, <clears throat> one of the lab movies <clears throat> that we made, um, I have this, this poor old, old, old virus a model that's falling apart. We're actually holding it together with scotch tape, which is kind of embarrassing, but it is an example of a virus with icosahedral capsid. And then, folks, these other two, the variola virus, the smallpox virus here, the um, rabies virus, and then our cool little T bacteriophage, they're called complex um, because they're more complex than just helical. They're more complex than just um, polyhedral. So with the smallpox virus, this is a DNA virus. It's good. It doesn't mutate rapidly. We have a um, we have a vaccine that we use to help eliminate it from the wild. It has um, several several layers, and there's no easily identified capsid. It has these lateral bodies. I'm not sure they even know what the lateral bodies do. Rabies viruses, you guys, are are so cool, although deadly. Um, they're cool and they're shaped like a bullet. And and truly, when they get into their brain, into our brains, it's like a bullet going through there, destroying our brains. Um, so that's the rabies bullet-shaped virus. And here's here's our T bacteriophage, you guys. And they're so complicated, aren't they great? So here's an icosahedral head, the capsid holding the DNA. Here's a helical portion, the cylinder, right? So this is helical. And then we have these cool tail fibers that have the adhesins on the ends. And remember, you guys, this cylinder, it functions like a hypodermic syringe and needle. It's going to use um, a internal cylinder to punch through the cell wall and cell membrane of the bacterium so the phage can inject its DNA into the bacterium and then that poor little bacterium is going to become a virus making machine. So genetic material and viruses, you guys, this can get really complicated because remember viruses break all of our rules. They really don't care about our central dogma of information flow in cells because they are viruses. They like to violate all, all of our rules. So remember, you guys, um, for viruses, they're either going to have DNA or RNAs, genetic information. Their um, nucleic acid uh, genome can be double-stranded or single-stranded. It might be linear or it could be circular. Um, we'll see with influenza viruses, they have multiple linear um, segments of RNA, almost like little chromosomes. The size of the genome, it goes from that little tiny polio size um, bacteriophage, the MS2, which only has three genes to make three proteins. Um, and in contrast, you guys, if we look at the smallest bacterium, chlamydia, 
chlamydia, for example, you've probably you've heard about, it can cause uh, sexually transmitted diseases and other infections. The smallest bact bacterium has a thousand genes, right? So you can see the little viruses, they have to invade a, another host cell, right? Because that host cell is going to supply all the biosynthetic machinery because the bacteria genetic information is, is too small. There's not enough information there to in encode the biosynthetic machinery, let alone to house ribosomes. This is such a cool photo, you guys. So this is an E. coli electron micrograph. E. coli has been lysed. This incredible, almost like a Medusa head here, um, or a pile of spaghetti. This is the single circular chromosome of E. coli. I just still find that absolutely unbelievable that that all can pack inside that little E. coli. But what makes this so dramatic, you guys, is here's the single circular chromosome, chromosomal DNA of E. coli, and here's that little tiny bit of bacteriophage genetic information, right? And again, the bacteria fogs, the viruses carry so little genetic information, that's why they have to parasitize a cell to use all of its bio, this biosynthetic machinery to make copies of themselves. So folks, this is probably a good table just to try to remember the columns and the rows here. So a real, real simple way to classify viruses is on two properties. First of all, what's their genetic information? Are they DNA viruses or RNA viruses, right? Okay, and then there's a second property that's really important for us to know if you were to discover a new virus. And that is, it is the virus that we call naked, meaning it lacks an envelope. And we'll explain what we mean by an envelope. Or is the virus enveloped? Now, just really quickly, you guys, naked viruses tend to remain infectious in the environment outside of their host for long periods of time. So as an example, you guys, um, and you, you probably instinctively know this. So a naked DNA um, human virus is the human papillomavirus, HPV, which causes, it's sometimes referred to as the wart virus, right? So um, it can remain, once it's shed into the environment, it could remain, for example, infectious if it was lying on a gym floor or the uh, floor of a shower or maybe on the concrete around a pool okay and then a naked RNA virus is the polio virus and again this kind of makes sense because we know we can get infected with polio virus through the fecal oral route it's shed in feces if people are infected and then because it's a naked virus it can remain in um, infectious in the environment for long periods of time so wherever the feces goes the polio virus goes and if we ingest the fecal contaminated food or drink the fecal contaminated water, that's how we're going to get infected. Now, in contrast, folks, we'll see these envelope viruses. Um, they steal, they steal some host cell membrane when they escape from the cell they've um, uh, replicated in. And host cell membrane, you guys remember, um, it's phospholipid bilayer. Um, we use a fluid mosaic model. It has a consistency of olive oil, right? It's not very strong. So one good thing about envelope viruses is once they're shed into the environment, anything that damages the envelope um, prevents the virus from being able to infect another cell. And we'll explain why. It has to do with the location of, of the adhesins. But this means, folks, that in general, envelope viruses won't remain infectious in the environment for as long as naked, naked viruses, right? So um, example of envelope DNA viruses, the herpes viruses. So people are shocked when they hear that the chickenpox virus is a herpes virus, but it is. It's a big virus family. And then the hepatitis B virus is an envelope DNA virus. This one, you guys, you have to be careful with because um, in the envelope, the hepatitis B virus has so many proteins. It's almost like a second protein protective coat. So unfortunately, hepatitis B virus can remain infectious in the environment longer than we might predict, and especially if it's being um, protected by moist organic material. So moist organic material always pr provides a protective fort for all of the envelope viruses. Okay, And then if we go over here, folks, to envelope RNA viruses, um, influenza virus, HIV. And again, folks, this is, this is good because, um, again, if the inf influenza or HRV are shed into the environment, um, and there's any kind of damage to the envelope, just drying up or soap or alcohol, bleach, um, UV. Um, once that envelope is, is um, damaged, the viruses can't attach to um, host cells, so they're no longer infectious. And here, you guys, down here, Ebola, MERS, SARS, and here's, here's our darling little coronaviruses, and I'll have to add the novel coronavirus 
um, of 2019, 2020 here. These are RNA viruses, bad news, potential high mutation rates. Um, but to me, it's good news you guys are enveloped. And I've been fascinated hearing um, the reports on how long the, the novel coronavirus can remain infectious. And I'm hearing conflicting reports. Um, but depending on what, what surface um, the virus is on, like, like cardboard versus, say, plastic or stainless steel or copper, the range I'm hearing is that they can remain infectious from four, like four hours up to three days um, after they're shed from the host. And my question is, you get, and this is me just being a nerd, very often we detect the presence of viruses by using a technique called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And in polymerase ch chain reaction, what you're doing, you're amplifying, you're making billions of copies of, in this case, the viral RNA. So I'd like to know how those studies were done um, because you could have a, um, a damaged coronavirus on a surface, right? It's damaged, the envelope is damaged so it can't infect another person or another animal. And yet, if you, if you took a swab of that area and did PCR, PCR on it, you would recover coronavirus RNA. But again, folks, what we're interested in is, um, is the coronavirus still infectious on that surface? So that's something maybe we can all as a class look into here. Because how, how, when they say that the coronavirus can um, remain on a surface for three days, okay, so are they detecting it through PCR? Right? Or are they actually de using some kind of assay that tells us, yeah, three days after the coronavirus is on the handle of your shopping cart, it's still infectious. So I think that's an important question we should answer. These are some arthropod-borne um, enveloped RNA um, viruses that unfortunately are transmitted by the, um, the, geni the genus of mosquitoes called Aedes. And you guys might recall that with climate, global climate change going on, um, we now have what we believe are breeding colonies of 80s mosquitoes in Northern California. So the 80s mosquitoes, they're known to transmit yellow fever virus, Zika virus, ugh, doggone that Zika, dengue, chikungunya virus. So we're worried about these guys invading Northern California. Okay, folks, I know this is getting really long, so let me cut this off here, and then we'll keep going with our um, description of viral structure. Once we get into the details of the viral genetic information, it gets a little bit thick, so this is probably a good place to stop.